So uh, I'd like to formally welcome you all back. Um, we're uh, starting this afternoon with a, a session called Categorizing Rights. And our first speakers are uh, Jenna Hennerby and um, um, is Nicola here as well? I'm sorry, I wasn't, I, I wasn't part of the conversation before, but this is a co-authored paper uh, uh, for Jenna and Nicola Piper and uh, uh, additional co-authors, uh, including uh, Harry, who's here with us. Uh, and the paper is called Global Interstate uh, Bilateral Labor Migration Agreements as Migration Governance Tools and Analysis from a Gender Lens. So please, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'll jump right in. Uh, and if something happens in the, at some point, I have a, a young son at home who's not feeling well. So uh, Hari and I are going to tag team and, and Nicholas here as well. So this is a team effort that comes out of uh, a project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, it's a project that's spanning over a few years. And um, though with some COVID delays, we're catching up. And the plan and uh, today is to share a little bit of uh, what we've been doing, um, some of which has been shared in that paper, in the draft paper. Um, the project involves a uh, macro level and some um, case studies. Um, and so what we're going to share with you today is some of the macro level that we've been doing in terms of uh, starting to create a global database of bilateral agreements and coding them according to um, gender and uh, gender responsiveness and what we've been doing about and some of the thinking we've been doing around gender responsive migration governance, feminist approaches to governing labor migration. So um, we want to share some of that with you. We're going to share some of our case study that we want to get into in a little bit detail and uh, welcome your input um, uh, as well. So Hari, uh, can you share the screen? Oh, okay. Try to share your slides. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. Um, that's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, oh. the project, uh, is it working, Harry? Sorry, sorry, Zena. Uh, it's a new device, so I'm having problem to. Do you want to make me co-host as well, and then I can do it in case? Yeah, sure. That would be great. Thank you. Sorry, folks. So much fun, eh? All the great tech fun. <laughs> Here, I think it should work now, Jenna. Aren't we going to miss this when it's all over? No. <laughs> Not at all, actually, not even a little bit. Okay, can people see my screen? Yes. Great. Yes, so, we do. Um, I'll just carry on then, Hari, okay? Sure. Okay, so uh, we also have another co-author who's not with us today, um, who's a postdoc with us named Kira Williams, who's actually the mastermind behind management of the global database. So I'll do my best to address uh, the questions um, that may have been better fielded by, by Kira. Okay, so uh, in the creation of a database, what we've done is uh, try to um, build on um, existing frameworks and databases that, that already have been put together, including one that I built with Kira uh, in 2015 for a World Bank project. Um, so um, we've been trying to create a database that basically goes from 1930 to present day. Um, uh, to give us a historical perspective. Um, and uh, we've also uh, referred to the work of Chilton and Posner, which uh, is a more recent um, database that brings together material as well as ILO material that we can find. Uh, what we've done is take those sources as well as additional sources by doing searches through databases um, uh, at gov from governments and from ILO and uh, IOM and any other UN sources we can find in order to find the databases uh, or in order to find uh, the bilateral agreements. But as you know, getting paper copies of bilateral agreements is pretty challenging. Um, uh, but where we're looking for at least their existence uh, and then working on getting access to those actual documents of those sources. So uh, what we've then do done is drawn a subsample. Uh, well, in the end, our, our database right now has 583 bilateral labor migration agreements. Uh, and we've used that somewhat loosely. We've got MOUs in there as well. Um, and uh, they cover 182 countries uh, between the period of 1930 and 2015. We're looking to update it further. Uh, in fact, we, we probably have um, 
we, well, we've been adding sources into it. Uh, and I think we probably have quite a number that are uh, right up until the present day. Um, and, uh, but uh, I wanted to make sure that I was accurate in the accounting. So this is a conservative estimate. I'm pretty sure we're gonna end up with about 620 is I think where we're gonna end up. So um, the, uh, the process or the data that we have includes country, continent, agreement type, uh, as well as gender related information. And what we're looking for there is if, is if there's been any gender markers, so if it says women, for example, um, explicitly, uh, but then also if certain sectors have been flagged, right? So if domestic workers have been flagged, we wanna know that as well. Um, and so we're trying to, to do that. Um, at this surface level, that's the basic level of coding that we're doing now. When we've got our subsample, we're doing a careful read and, a, and more qualitative coding along indicators around gender. We've also got date of signature, et cetera. Um, this is basically a, a listing of the variables we have for those of you data types that like to see those sorts of things. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of some basic descriptives analysis of what we have so far um, uh, of the, uh, the data, we historical data remember. So we're looking at um, Europe being the predominant place that has bilateral agreements and the majority of countries are, are there. Uh, we know, however, that in recent decades, that number has, uh, the, the greatest number has shifted uh, with the majority of bilateral uh, growth in bilateral agreements being in Asia. And so we can get into that, obviously, and people are aware of those things. Um, uh, the majority of bilateral agreements, however, been signed after 1990. So when we think historically about their growth and their usage as an instrument of governance of labor migration, um, that uptick is significant since that time frame. Um, and, uh, and I think we can more than safely say we were well into uh, a period uh, where these instruments are the primary instrument that is being ruled out to govern labor migration. Um, uh, we've looked at all the different um, types of BLA, so those that are more formalized and, and those that are in and solely MOUs. We've identified 66 that were relevant to gender explicitly, um, so um, based on what I had mentioned previously. We found out of those, um, as I said, most were in Europe. Um, uh, many are still in force to present um, that we've been identifying. Uh, and uh, we see it as a really critical starting point uh, for doing a more um, uh, thorough gender analysis. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Harry, Harry in a second, but first let me just say that uh, in our careful and more detailed analysis of bilateral agreements, so those that we've selected to do more in-depth work with, we've created a large spreadsheet that has in it all of the relevant international instruments. Um, and, and they include SETA, all of the recommendations of SETA that are relevant. So in particular, recommendation number 26, number 38, uh, for example. Um, and then all of the other instruments that we feel are most relevant, such as ILO 189. And we've used these instruments to go through each of the documents to assess their compliance with international agreements. And then we've gone further. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about what that's involved in, in a second. Uh, but just to say that the uh, intention has been to do a full analysis uh, using these international agreements as, as operating uh, as, as, um, as touchstones, um, because all too often these agreements tend to operate outside of those kinds of frameworks. So we spent some time operationalizing what's meant what we consider gender responsiveness to mean. We've, we've uh, created a kind of gender responsiveness scale. Um, and here we've uh, got a sort of th um, thematic description of, of that scale, where on the top end, the most feminist approach is one that is transformative of existing gender inequalities. It is not simply about ensuring women are mentioned or women's passports have been, been taken. <laughs> it's about actually tackling some of the structural realities that lead to um, the perpetuation of gender inequality um, and how migration governance needs to play or does play a role in that. Um, and so we've, uh, we've also uh, been developing a gender and migration hub and uh, it's under development, but I'll give people a sneak preview here if you wanna check it out 
uh, you can go to this link where we have actually been uh, putting together a lot of work, uh, mostly focused around the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration. Uh, but it's where we're thinking a lot about how, um, how to actually in, uh, create and monitor policies, including uh, bilateral agreements in terms of their gender responsiveness. So I'll turn it over to Harry to discuss this case study, which is a bit tiny, but we didn't know how to show it. So we thought we'd just put up some picture. This is a problem with doing big textual analysis, right? We could have put up a picture, but uh, an image uh, of people, but we figured uh, we, would, we would start with this. So Harry, I'll turn it over to you for a few minutes. Okay, thank you, Zena. Um, as Zena mentioned, um, out of 66 uh, subsample um, BL BLMAs that uh, we coded, I mean, that uh, were coded uh, from gender uh, perspective. Um, the sample, I mean, the sample, uh, uh, subsample is highly concentrated in Europe. 83.6% of all uh, those that were uh, uh, looked at from gender perspective. Um, and in, in a North America, uh, and a South America, and in Asia, only 3.7% uh, were directly, I mean, they reference gender uh, somehow. So uh, therefore, uh, uh, we are really interested in, uh, for this particular paper, uh, we are really interested in uh, looking at, um, in, in the Asian context, especially with the focus on uh, women migrant domestic workers. So uh, given the fact that especially uh, women migrant workers working in informal sectors, such as domestic work, especially uh, as our case study is based in the GCC countries in the Middle East, um, given the fact um, that even the national laws do not include uh, domestic war um, um, in these countries, in these destination countries. And also given the fact that multilateral uh, frameworks do not exist um, and even regional frameworks such as the Abu Dhabi dialogue, the Colombo process, they have grossly failed when it comes to the protection uh, of the rights of uh, women migrant domestic workers. Um, so therefore- I, I could just ask that you start wrapping up because we're running out, out of time. Oh, okay, thank you. So therefore, uh, gender responsive BLMAs are crucial, but we really want to point out that they cannot replace the uh, obligation under international legal and normative uh, laws um, and they require monitoring and evaluation. Um, and they do not, in fact, more importantly, do not address the structural uh, inequalities that uh, pre-exist. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, Next can, slide, you please. can you see it, Hari? No. Oh, weird. How about now? Okay, yeah. okay, great. Sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, considering the time uh, constant, uh, um, so what we uh, really, uh, um, in, 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 in the context of women migrant domestic workers, the glaring uh, fact is that it is a missing link. Gender is largely missing from bilateral agreements and even where they exist. Uh, they are gender blind uh, is based on, uh, on the scale of, uh, that Jenna mentioned, gender biased to gender blind or to some extent gender sensitive. But the implementation again uh, is, a, is, a, is, is a, a problem. So therefore uh, our primary uh, set of recommendation um, against this back, uh, back background is that there has to be uh, sector spe uh, specific uh, BLMAs are crucial, 
especially um, in informal sectors. And they should comply with the international normative and legal instruments and the treaties. And uh, there should be clauses should be provided in the BLMAs that really speak to gender specific uh, issues and especially the working and living conditions of women migrant workers um, should be explicitly uh, mentioned uh, in them. Um, so, uh, okay, with that. Uh, We're out of time, I, but we'll, we'll, yeah. we can pick it up later. Sorry, we run out of time there, but uh, okay. thanks so everyone. Thank and, and the paper, we have some of our recommendations in there and uh, I'm happy to share the slides as well. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Sorry. So I just, I did not mention uh, your, uh, I did not introduce you properly. So let me just say uh, that Jenna is from the uh, Wilfrid Laurel uh, University and Nicola is from Queen Mary University of London. And Harry, I presume it belongs to one of these institutions as well. Uh, and your respondent is uh, Yehel Kurlander, uh, who is uh, from the Traflab project and also from Tehai Academic College. Yehel, over to you. Thank you. So thank you so much for this uh, thrilling, insightful uh, presentation. And thank you uh, for the paper that I had the honor of reading it. Reading your paper made me realize that empirical proof is so valuable, especially when something seems almost obvious to the feminist, well, cynical and depressed perspective, like what was I thinking? Of course, BLMs are not feminist. So thank you. Thank you for taking one for the team and examining and analyzing hundreds of BLMs in order to come to the conclusion that as you wrote, many BLMs in use today have been conceived, negotiated and implemented in a gender biased and gender blind way. They largely ignore gender issues like gender responsive measures and monitoring mechanism and only a small number contain gender specific, uh, specific provisions. However, you did much more than just prove the unsurprising findings. To start with, descriptively, you showed that there were no BLMs signed from the 90s to 2015 that confronted any gender issues. That is actually a shocking finding, consider, well, you know, the 21st century. In response, you have complied a detailed and comprehensive, truly wonderful list of the various ways in which gender aspects should be uh, integrated into BLMs. This list of suggestions and recommendations for change and improvement is a worthy response to a world when the hierarchy ladder of rights is simple and cruel. First, we should be thankful if the BLM is not only about control, but also includes some protection in the shape of human rights. Then we should be grateful if it includes workers' rights. And then we should be indebted if it includes migrants' rights. And finally, we are supposed to be overwhelmed and full of gratitude if it includes women's rights, right? So it's the bottom of the ladder. However, a women migrant work availability is unordered in a ladder or a scale. It intersects. Intersectionality as a theoretical and methodological framework is well suited to analyze the position of women migrant workers. It helps us to examine the way these discriminatory structures operate simultaneously on individual and group who are socially positioned within in intersections of access such as gender, class, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and other. Intersectional analysis teach us that it should always be localized and conceptualized. To state the obvious, BLMs are embedded in power relations between the countries, but gender, class, ethnicity, sexuality, do not remain out of the conversation. Behind the importance of the text itself, analyzing BLMs should also include question of how it may or may not protect women, but also how it affect them. In a study I am currently conducting together with Shachar Shoam from the Humboldt University of Berlin about time migrant women in Israel agriculture, it appears that the BLA has unexpected and unintended consequences for women, their de facto extension from the temporary migration program. One main reason for this was the implementation of a random and supervised mechanism placing the worker to a specific farmer in an effort to eliminate corruption and illegal fees around the process. This step canceled the ability of employers to choose their employees and vice versa before arrival. This changes has a fundamental influence on Thai women 
as it eliminates the possibility for them to migrate together with their spouses or other acquaintances. This left them in a position of not knowing where they would live and work. Their inability to choose their employer in Israel minimized their use and support of pre-existing social networks. Our assumption is that the women's vulnerability has increased within the implementation of the bilateral agreement and that it has led to the reduction in the number of women labor migrants to Israel entering. This change also had an influential role of the Thai men migrants. While for them, it was intended to maintain their well-being with a supportive community, for the women, it was an act of survival. In the Israeli arena, BLH have emerged as the main tool, as Ilan Yuval showed mainly as a means of control, but also as a tool to protect workers from high recruitment fees. They succeeded in that, but created a wide range of other problems, such as the one currently being discussed between them. As suggested by the authors, gender-responsive gender BLMs should incorporate a gender perspective with specific attention and measures for groups such as women migrant workers. They should aim to create equality in opportunities, right, obligation, treatment, and outcomes for women and men, and should include special measures to address inequality. Such agreements should consider factors rooted in the gender division of labor and power relation between men and women, and should take into account who benefit and who does not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yehel. Um, and thank you for being so mindful of the time. This was wonderful. Uh, Jenna Hari, would you like to respond before we take any questions? Sure. Uh, can I just start by saying thank you so much for that uh, insightful uh, input. It was really helpful. Um, and we're, we're, um, the context of Israel is really interesting right now and thinking about those uh, particular agreements. And I think, um, you know, part of what we want to try to do is really demonstrate how the agreements function, um, not necessarily in the interest of women migrants. And even if framed or couched as in language of protection, it's often not, uh, again, it's done through more in a paternalistic way as compared to thinking about actually engaging migrant work, women migrant workers uh, in terms of their own needs and enabling them to be able to um, protect their own rights. So um, I think that's a, a really another interesting case and the idea of thinking about the unintended consequences is just as important um, as the intended because again, what are the intended consequences? Let's take a step back. The intended outcome of bilateral agreements are to move labor, <laughs> to move workers from point A to point B to fill given kinds of labor demands. They're not actually designed around enabling rights protection. They've got a bunch of clauses shoved in in certain cases, but that's not what their inception was about. So thank you for that. And I welcome other comments and questions. Thank you very much for, for this absolutely important research project and for this paper and presentation. Um, so I, I want to share with you that I did a, a, a project with Hyderabad, an university in Hyderabad in India. Uh, a group of students in Tel Aviv and a group of students in, uh, in Hyderabad tried to, to write a bilateral agreement to Israel and India. We didn't, oh, there, there's no such a, an agreement currently between Israel and India. And we didn't do any negotiations. The idea was just to produce the best uh, the best BLA we can do, right? It wasn't a, a negotiation exercise. It was just about, okay, if we were to do the model BLA, what would it be about? And it was about domestic workers migration. And then the amount of gender that was injected into it by the students, you know, they did interviews with workers on both sides and were and based the, the BLA on that. And the amount of gender stuff that was in there, there was pregnancy and sexual harassment and, uh, and, and, and there are questions, there are issues related to children um, and, you know, just uh, uh, so, so much more than we would see in any BLA that that made me just absolutely so aware to the terrible gender absence from BLAs. Um, I will say that when we look at collective agreements, 
for years, just labor collective agreements, I'm not even talking about it. For years, I mean, so many labor collective agreements still don't have a lot of gender in them. I mean, less and less, but still that's the case. Um, so, and, and I'm saying that, you know, as a, a labor scholar reading collective agreements as well. Um, and so, you know, I'm, uh, this is one of the cases that, you know, you, I, I usually don't quickly say that, but you just need more women around the table. I think that's just the case in terms of these negotiations. Um, I don't know that that's always, you know, that always just having a, uh, you know, you can have uh, gender minded people around the table, but I think when it comes to this, it sometimes feels not enough. So I just want to thank you for showing what I, you know, through that exercise, what I've been uh, experiencing. Um, I do want to ask, you know, if you can give some examples, um, just kind of anecdotal examples that you can share with us here as well, of the kind of the best stuff you've seen, like what was the one surprising best thing you've seen in the BLA, if there was such a thing? <laughs> So thank you. Uh, Jenna, would you like to say, let's take it one by one. I think we still have time. I think Nicola actually was going to speak. Go ahead, Nicola. Yeah, you know, if I may quickly come in, because you know you asked you know, about the best thing we might have seen as far as um, bilateral agreements are concerned. And earlier when Yahel mentioned, thank you Yahel, also I would like to say, thank you so much for your generous comments. It was really, really, um, reassuring to know, you know, we are sort of on the right track here. And um, you, because Yahya uh, um, mentioned intersectionality, which is of course, and also in a highly super important concept. And I've just recently um, given a little presentation where in addition to class, race, ethnicity, I also added skill. Uh, and because you, Hila, just asked, you know, have we ever seen a, a, a bilateral agreement that's actually good? Uh, also in terms of gender, there is one uh, I can immediately think of, and it's always being heralded as a good practice example. And this is the recent bilateral agreement between Germany and the Philippines. But the reason why I say intersectionality is it's for uh, the migration of nurses. So in that sense, highly skilled. Um, and the reason why it is um, heralded as one of the, you know, really, really, really well functioning um, bilateral agreements is because the trade unions are involved. And this comes also back to what Jennifer Gordon asked yesterday, you know, about labor market institutions and the important involvement of certain actors who are actually interested in promoting the rights of migrants, female, male, anyone, right? And although the unions were not involved in the actual negotiation, they are involved in the whole implementation and monitoring. So the um, Filipinas, um, uh, and this is the uh, Public Service International and their national um, affiliates, both in the Philippines and in Germany. So they have combined meetings. They, they follow the entire process from hiring, the language training, you know, the actual movement and what happens in Germany. So they are fully covered by collective bargaining agreements. They have the, exactly the same rights as um, uh, local nurses. Um, but the other thing also is because the German government also, you know, invests heavily into this, there is also a pathway for permanent residents, right? So this is not the classic temporary employer type contract migration as we see so much in intra-Asian migration dynamics. So that's why I just quickly wanted to say when we talk about intersectionality, we also have to bring in skill. I um, mean, there is a massive difference between low skill or what is usually classified as low skill, and this is unfortunately domestic work worker migration and the highly skilled. And if I may just quickly add, because Hila also mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the involvement of, uh, well, the, the attitude of institutions. Um, I've been involved in a project done by UN Women where our Bangladeshi counterpart and an anthropologist did a study of migrant women themselves and their experience. And they were clearly, and they were all domestic workers, and they were clearly saying, you know, even the institutions completely disregard them. They never ask, you know, what their experience was, they feel like they are a nothing. Yeah, so the Ministry of Foreign Affairs doesn't care about their experience. All they care for is deploying remittances. And what we were also talking about yesterday, just the, the, the migrants head down, sticking to doing, fulfilling their, their contracts, their work, not complaining, being docile and, and returning when they're supposed to return. And this is it. Thank um, you, Nicola. Jenna, did you want to? I was just going to add that there's the, the one sort of key thing that I'm still struck by is that the instruments 
really aren't doing anything for us to actually tackle gender equality and gender inequality. So what we're, what we're seeing is fine, they might work in terms of, maybe they're fabulous in terms of protection of rights of one group of workers in one moment in one sector and maybe even pathway to PR. But does that tackle the fact of broad scale gender inequality where women's migration is predominantly channeled into gendered work uh, that is devalued? No, it does not. Does it also handle and deal with the realities around LGBTQ plus and the way in which gender is very um, normatively regulated through these instruments? And from a gender perspective, from a gender equality and human rights perspective beyond the you know, protection of migrant women workers, right? Beyond that frame, um, we're not seeing much hope. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, Harry, did I, you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to point out, looking at uh, B, uh, BLMAs, uh, I mean, I, 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 we think that we have to be context uh, specific as well. Because let me give you an example of Nepal. Uh, women migrant domestic workers from Nepal in the Middle Eastern countries, especially in the GCC countries. So since the, the bilateral agreements between the government of Nepal and the governments in the destination countries, they do not exist at all, they're non-existent. So these women are, I mean, have to, are resorting to illegal routes and channels through India and Sri Lanka and that pushes them even to, to, to more vulnerability. So therefore, when it really comes to this specific context, the Nepali context, at least having the BLMAs in place, um, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's a, a, we, it, I mean, that, that is, uh, um, I mean, something uh, good right, from their perspective, from their lived experience, from the perspective of their lived realities. So therefore, it has to be context-best, sectoral-best, as uh, Nicola pointed out. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention this. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Adam. Uh, three quick thoughts. First, I'm so glad that uh, Hilla and Tamar uh, organized this conference because I recognize how many of us are, are working on the same problem of just trying to figure out what the BLAs are. And for instance, Maggie already mentioned in the chat, but I think she and I at the same time were tackling this problem and essentially redoing the same work. And it, only after our paper, we really been both doing this. And so um, one, people should look at her paper and include those BLAs, but also that going forward, hopefully we can move to one uh, one specific list that we're we're all chipping in on. Thought two is it really is amazing looking at the gender piece, the disconnect between um, the kind of uh, Nepalese experience that we talked about yesterday with uh, Arushman's paper on how and what some other comments raised that uh, gender related human rights violations I think are at the foremost of sending countries' minds. What they're really afraid of is the domestic workers and specifically women that are alone in people's houses and getting sexually assaulted and abused and um, having their rights violated in so many ways. And even though that's in the discussion about human rights, how little of it seems to be in the texts of these treaties uh, and just an incredible what the disconnect is. Third thought is that um, although there isn't literature on the um, effects uh, to, to my knowledge of BLAs and gender in the way that you're doing now, there are, are, you know, in at least political science and law efforts to study the effects of women's rights treaties, constitutional provisions on gender equality, et cetera. Um, and unfortunately, they're often uh, de depressing the results where adopting various treaties or incorporating language into the constitution doesn't uh, often move the needle on gender equality within a country. And given that, given how under-enforced and vague BLAs are, um, I'm perhaps not as surprised that, that these treaties and the ways that the comments just raised have not really, um, minus maybe some sector specific job specific area, really translated into to, um, really promoting equality for these, um, for um, female workers. Anyway, really interesting stuff. So maybe we should take, uh, all, is that okay? We'll take all three comments and then have a round of uh, you to respond. 
Is that okay? So uh, Maggie, please. Yeah, I just want to uh, first second Adam's point of like, it'd be great because Tiana and I have built have been coding more stuff. I coded stuff for my original paper, 2019 paper. So if we could put this all together in one place, that would be fantastic. But I also was thinking about um, whether with these treaties and depending on what states you have, receiving states signing it, whether you have two different issues going on, like the um, states of the global north, like Germany or Japan and places like that, say like, oh, we already cover women's rights in our domestic law. What's the need for this? And then on the flip side, the like GCC countries are like, we don't give our own women rights. Why would we give your women rights? Like, so I was wondering if, the, if we could think about the states that might be the sweet spots where like the inclusion of rights would actually do something productive. Um, and, and might actually, and might really be able to both be included because I think Germany would say like, yeah, I'm happy to put those rights in maybe, but like, it's not gonna really affect things. Um, and the GCC countries would be like, yeah, we can put those things in, I'm not gonna enforce them. But like, is there a set in the middle? Like I would traditionally think of like, you know, maybe, maybe a Jordan type, um, maybe also, you know, if they're ones that are, um, like maybe Malaysia, places like that, where we think that like this could actually do some real work for it. Um, and that's also sort of pulling off the political science literature. I'm thinking about like work by Beth Simmons um, and by um, Emily Hafner Burton. Um, and I think even Una Hathaway had some stuff on, on this sort of stuff back in the day. Um, thinking about when states actually comply with human rights treaties. So I would look at that literature. Terrific, thank you. And Ayushman, you'll be last and then we'll have responses. Yes, um, thank you so much first for the presentation. I'm also interested in understanding the unintended consequences of PLAs. And of course, my like case study was like Nepalese domestic work and you know, the PLAs designed or not. Uh, and how PLAs is being worked and you know, what, how people be, like, you know, respond to these like migration governance rules. Now, uh, the thing that you mentioned, uh, the recommendation section is basically, I believe, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a model ILO's recommendations, you know, and, and, and you mentioned uh, Nepal, Jordan, uh, bilateral agreement on labor, uh, sorry, on uh, domestic work. Uh, and I believe the majority of the recommendation follows that particular, you know, model. But the question here is whether these, like, you know, like amazing tool is good, is changing anything on the ground, you know. As far as I am concerned, I mean, I did a research with like, you know, uh, uh, migrant domestic workers, let's say, uh, this is residing in an area which is called as trafficking prone. And they say that if they go through regular channel, all they get is debt, lot of hassle from the government. And when they go through irregular channel, rather than like, you know, like investing, a lot of money on, you know, like facilitating like proper migration, you know, through proper migration channel, ch chances are very, very high that they get money in turn. The majority of the women say that, you know, go, migrating via irregular channel is much, much more beneficial to them while migrating via regular channel. And chances are very high that they will be exploited equally, if not more in regular channel. And, and, and I mean, I mean I, I, that, that reminds me of one of the quotes that uh, um, uh, some, one of my participants told me during a focus group discussion that it's just like a lottery, you know, and we have to take, it really doesn't matter whether the state is facilitating our migration or some smuggler or traffickers is facilitating our migration. So I believe, I mean, some of the recommendation could be very, very counterproductive uh, because I mean, clearly there are the studies done by like Sharon Pickering and, you know, Rebecca Napier more, and they say that it's it's a very very ambivalent situation because the moment you try to govern, you know, migration for domestic work, chances are very high that you might end up doing much more harm than good. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on you know, this particular issue. Thank you, Aishman. And uh, Jenna Nicola Hari. Yes, uh, Jenna, you have something immediately you wish to say, or I. Is she there? You go ahead, Nicola. Okay. Um, but 
fantastic comments. Thank you so much. I'm still digesting uh, in my head um, uh, Maggie's uh, 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 comment and, and ultimate um, question about the in-between um, space. Uh, I guess you know where you started, Maggie, that was sort of what I was pathetically trying to get at yesterday in my very messy uh, commentary um, when I sort of said to uh, Ihira and you, I mean, one of the things that might be interesting is also to look beyond the immediate text of bilateral agreements and the, embed them in the broader political space or regime or, I mean, they use the uh, uh, phrase democracy in their paper, you know, to kind of say, well, should certain countries of destination and maybe also um, proactively choose uh, mm -hmm. countries of origin where they know um, the, the rights of migrants are protected more because certain instruments are ratified and not only ratified, but are also being properly implemented and so forth. But because you asked um, after an, an, an space in the middle, um, now I, the, the only immediate answer I have is um, as, a, as a political um, sociologist who is essentially also interested in advocacy politics, my immediate answer would be um, Hong Kong. And the reason why I'm saying this is because what at least Hong Kong offers, and I guess you, many of you are completely aware of the situation there, is the political space for domestic workers to organize themselves and to begin and to, to make their own demands, right? And they have been, you know, a little bit successful in some regards, but not obviously entirely successful, you know, getting all the demands they've been wanting um, to have, but they have definitely contributed to this whole um, um, political activism and advocacy um, movement, which is then also contributed to the ILO Convention 189 ultimately. So I guess um, from that point of view, I would say maybe a space like Hong Kong, but I can't sort of uh, immediately think of um, something else and I would have to reflect on this a little bit more, but um, yeah, in, in great comment. And also the authors you mentioned, uh, we definitely need to follow up, thanks. I got a second now, or how are we wrapping up? Um, so, so yes, I'm. I'm also thinking about uh, Maggie's comment, uh, but also Adams as well, and and it's making me think more about what are the metrics for measuring success. What are we? What are the outcomes we're looking for as compared to? Let's look at agreements and do a checkbox of the stuff that sh should be in them, aka the ILO you know, <laughs> guidance or the GCM, uh, the new uh, UN um, Network for Migration, I'm part of a bilateral working group uh, four, and we're coming out with a, guide, a guidance document for governments on how to make, you know, good bilateral agreements. We can't all agree upon it, but it's fine. Um, and, and, and it'll be coming out, but it's again, it's these sort of check boxes of things that should be in there. And it's a very, um, sort of backwards Foucault of thinking where we're stuck within the structure itself and just trying to work at sort of somehow um, taking all the boxes within it without thinking about what does it do in terms of outcomes in the same way Adam's point and uh, around, you know, we have, um, you know, uh, in the case of when SETA gets, um, you know, uh, signatory ratified and, and made uh, and put into national law, do we actually see outcomes in terms of um, increased uh, gender equality by some set of markers? Maybe it's the Gini markers or whatever. Um, but those indexes, those gender inequality indexes, I think are useful and we're, we're not really applying them when we're thinking about migration governance. And so this is something that I've been trying to figure out. Is there a way that we could maybe take some of those indicators as a as a, as a benchmark in our analysis, looking at some of these cases, uh, is there a way to do it at a more global level? Um, and so thanks for all the, the sources, also food for thought for us to try to move this further ahead. Um, and, uh, and yes, thinking about those middle cases, really important, because even in the case of Canada, you've got you know, the, the, the global north problem. Yeah, yeah, we already have everything in place. We protect women's rights in Canada, so we don't need bilateral agreements for that, right? Um, but, uh, we know that um, there, um, the, you know, there's all sorts of issues in terms of women migrants in Canada, uh, and particularly facing women migrant workers in agriculture, but also in domestic work. So anyway, um, thanks for your inputs. I, I feel like I have lots to think about and um, really felt it was a valuable exchange. I, with, I wish I could have been involved more. Um, my son is ill. And so I've been a little bit unable. He's fine, but it's nothing major serious, but um, I can't be as involved as I would have loved to have been. So thank you um, very much, everyone. Hope we continue the conversation.
So thank you all for a really wonderful uh, session. I really enjoyed it. Um, and Harry was... wanted to respond as well. Did you? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you, Ayushman, for, uh, for, for your comment. Um, it's really, uh, you pointed out, uh, I mean, a very uh, important, uh, made a very important point, uh, especially for poor women, you know, going through irregular channels, though it in entails risk, you know, they can't afford to pay even when these regular channels exist, they can't afford to pay the fees and all that involves with red tapism and bureaucracy and all that. Um, that's, that's an important point. Um, and, uh, but it's we uh, uh, in the scalar, uh, gender responsive scalar, you know, the feminist approach is, is, is an ideal space. I mean, the, the, the ideal of rose. Um, but even, but I think when we really look at, uh, uh, you know, the issues of migrant, domestic migrant workers, you know, from their living, uh, you know, lived experiences, you know, even if something, no matter how nominal it is, if it is better than what previously exists, Right, I think that makes a huge difference in the lives. So it's a question. It's a it's a, it's a it's a relative. It's it's always we have to look at it in uh, relative terms. I think, but what you pointed out, that's really uh, important and for us to think through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry.